Hi everyone, it's been wonderful reading your comments. Thank you for asking and thank you for watching. Um, you can, you know, listen to the whole thing or you can look down in the description and see if you can find your question with your YouTube uh, handle listed. So the first question is how to connect with other adult beginners to, you know, play duets. That, that is hard. And I've, you know, I'm not really sure. I've never done that. But if, if, if it were me and I were in your situation, one thing I would do is to join, I think there are different Facebook groups. There's an adult beginner, there's a violinist beginner or something. I would just do a quick little search on Facebook, join there and just say, hey, I'm in the, you know, Phoenix or Austin area. Would anyone want to connect, meet up, play some duets? Would love to, you know, interact and, and meet someone else doing the same thing. You could also join, <clears throat> there is an online registry. It's called uh, amateurmusic.org, A-M-N, amateurmusic.org. And it is, well, it's a network. So I think you, you I'm not sure how much you have to pay, but you probably register. And then you are, other people in your area, you know, I guess you get a, a listing or something like that. And then, you know, you can probably reach out through email and see if there's anyone that would like to get together. And, you know, it doesn't have to be another violin player. It could be a cellist. It could be um, a flute player. It could be someone else who plays an instrument. And then you can take a simple duet music and, and play. Like if, as long as two, the two instrumentalists say read treble clef, you can have two treble instruments. It could be, you know, flute and, and violin. The other, a great resource for the music, if you don't already know, is imslp.org. And then you can just type in simple duets or something and you'll come up with a lot of things. Uh, yeah, so uh, try those. It, there may be, if, there's a, if there are teachers uh, in your area, I don't know how, what, what size city you live in, but you might just reach out and say, hey, you know, please feel free to share my name and email with any students that you might have that would like to get together and play, play duets. So this person asked me, you know, what do I wish I'd known when I started violin as a beginner? And, you know, to qualify, I was five. So I don't have, I don't really remember starting. I, I have a few, you know, recollections, but I don't think that I was taught this. And this is what I think would have probably made one of the biggest differences. I don't think I would have had the capacity to have any sort of nuanced thought and to really have been a, quite an effective or efficient practicer at that age. But if I'd have been taught some simple rules about tuning and about intonation, and if I had been encouraged to use that personal agency to check my tuning, I think that I would have shaved years and years, or I would have my, at least my development of, into, of good intonation would have developed a lot faster. I had a mom that played piano. So I think that, you know, my teacher probably thought, well, you know, she has that support playing with piano, but you know, we didn't do it all that regularly. It was certainly helpful. And I'm sure that my teacher corrected intonation as needed, but I, I didn't have a grasp or I didn't understand the physics of the violin to understand how to use open strings as a way to constantly, and use this on a regular basis to, to check intonation. I of course knew that an octave is an octave and I, I could check third fingers. I don't know that I did, but you know, again, I, I, I need, I, it would have been great to have been really encouraged on a regular basis to do this. Um, Hey, 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 little Beth, let's play Twinkle Twinkle now. Let's check your third finger. What do you think about that? Do you hear that? And I would have been like, yeah, I don't think that sounds very good. Well, what can you do about that? You know, and then I would have become more sensitive at, at hearing the, the, the good blend between, you know, notes that I'm playing and open strings. Okay, so that's just an octave. I didn't know that first fingers should be in melodic situations like playing Twinkle Twinkle. It is a melody. 
I didn't know that those first fingers, to be absolutely correct, should tune to the higher open string. I don't even know, well, it was very late that I knew that. Because very likely I would have tuned it to my open D. kind of flat. It's because I tuned it to my D. And I certainly didn't know back when I was young that first finger should tune to the higher open string. So here's how it sounds with my higher open string. I did, I, in the place that it was, that I just had it. Ooh, right? No, it needs to be a little bit higher. And that when I'm playing melodies, that's the correct B. Such an easy check. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fact. Second fingers, second fingers, you know, low twos. If I'm playing a melody, then my low two needs to tune with my open D string. Not my open E string. So it's a little out of tune with my open E. And for the purposes of playing melodies where I have low twos, it needs to be like that. It should tune with my lower D. Now, I don't know that I could have known that back then. I don't know that most teachers really, really know how, hmm, how our tuning systems work, okay? So this is a subject that I love and I'm very passionate about, and someday I'm gonna have a YouTube video on this. It will be like a seminar, but it will be in the nuances of our tuning systems, Pythagorean versus just, in any case. Had I known that, or at, at the very least, at the very least, been encouraged to use this tool that is built in, it is in our auditory system, we can hear when pitches are not in tune when played together, and to use that regularly, to check in regularly, I think that, I think, again, my that that long trajectory of learning how to play in tune consistently oh gosh would have been a lot a lot shorter all right so i our next question is about you know getting comfortable and working with the equipment and you know what happens when you just try everything and you can't find what's right i mean i hear you i hear you i started violin lab in like 2007 and if you were to scan all the videos on my site, you would, you'll see four chin rests, three chin rests, four, four shoulder pads. You'll see an assortment. So I, you know, I've tried everything and I think, I think I'm finally there, but, but you got to hack. And so what I did is, okay, I'll start with the shoulder pad. Now, this is embarrassing, honestly. Let me put my violin down real quick. Okay. So. This is a mock hook, and I really did like the contour of, of, of the shoulder of the shoulder pad. You know, I, I like that kind of little hook there. But this part, I mean, this was, you know, just digging into my collarbone. So drugstore, foot aisle, cushy shoe inserts. They're kind of gel-like and they, they have a, a nice kind of grippy surface. And I mean, I've tried different ones. I have, there. this is one kind and then this is something, and I just cut them. I just cut them into, you know, smaller pads. And then just rubber band that you find, you know, holding, you know, asparagus stalks together. I do have some nano silicon tape because I I just couldn't find a rubber band, but but anyway, just rubber band them on there. And and this A for me, so even if you know you don't have the issue with the shoulder pad digging in, it does it does help with gripping. It does help with gripping. Because for me, sliding, oh, sliding is the worst. So so that's what okay, that's that's shoulder pad. Okay, chin rest. So I mean, this this is the tall model of the wave wave chin rest wavechinrest.com, and and the inventor maker he's a violinist. Turns out, <laughs> I didn't even know this. <laughs> he lives a mile and a half to where I was 
temporarily living in Kentucky. And I'm like, oh, so I could just walk to your house? Anyway, so he helped modify. But he will send you, you know, like four, I think. You can try. The, there's a couple of different mo models and heights. I also asked him to, to really just, you know, dig a little bit more. I wanted a, even a more pronounced lip. And what's special about these is that they extend past the end of the instrument, right? Right here. So no other chin rest does that. You get a little bit more support under your jaw. So it's kind of like more of a head rest, like a whole side of the head rest. And yeah, so I love, I love the chin rest. I wanted to try and fill the space between my shoulder and my head with more of a ch the chin rest so that my violin can be lower, right? So if I were to have a shoulder pad and I were to unscrew the legs as far as possible and then have a kind of a flat chin rest, then the violin's up here. That means my shoulder has to be up here to hit the strings and that's a lot of tension in the shoulder. So you'll have a more relaxed bow arm and a better tone if you can get the violin as far down here as possible. So keep building up that chin rest. And then of course here, the situation here is that, I mean, I, the, the, the legs are as down as far as they'll go. And then, but I did put the padding on for comfort. Now, for necks, for bad necks, um, now this is, okay, embarrassing, super embarrassing thing. So I can't believe I'm gonna put this out on the internet. But get yourself, like just get a pair of like stockings. Let me put my violin down. Okay, so this was the leg of a pair of tights. I just cut it off and I tied it into a knot. So it's a loop, okay. And then this is just, this was just a tie on, I think it was just a, a dress or something, a knit tie. You can make yours look better than this, but it does the trick. So stick your right arm through and up and over it goes. Now, it, I use this if I'm like have long rehearsals, it goes underneath the shirt, not on top. Again, kind of embarrassing, but it goes underneath so you wouldn't see it. And then this, so the tail here, you just kind of sit on, right? So this kind of gets this part out of the way of your arm. And then this just slips right over the chin rest and it really goes a long way in just helping me, you know, not have to use quite so much head weight because I do have issues with, you know, the muscles in my neck, my, my you know, spine back here. It's supposed to be curved and, you know, over time it's gone like that. So, you know, th this is really helpful. And like I said, in this you can sit on and it's all underneath so no one sees it. But um, anyway, so that's, that's a little... That's a little trick. That's a, that's a real life hack there. But the main thing is just don't give up. Don't give up. You just keep trying things. You keep trying until you find something that works. So this question has to do with shifting. And the question is, is you know, since it's easier, right, to shift where you your finger starts to push down the string and then you slide into a new note. You know, why can't we shift like that? Because you can hear the pitch coming. You know when you're there. And that's true. I mean, I would so much rather shift like that, so sliding into the note, than this way. Okay, that's harder. That's harder. However, there are rules that dictate what style of shift. So. These two styles, one is called expressive or romantic style, and then you have what I call the classical style of shifting. And so the classical style of shifting is when, the, when you shift via the old finger, when you get to the new position, new finger goes down. And that's the style of shifting we use if we, in music. Okay, this is just a convention. It, it, music, our, our style has evolved like this. Music written, eh, I would say, you know, early 19th century, so 1820s, 30s, 40s, and earlier. Okay, so imagine, imagine playing the Bach A minor. 
mean, it would sound a little, now I exaggerated it, but it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't sound right. You know, and hopefully you sense that. Like there's something, even if you don't know a lot about music history, you're like, I don't think you're supposed to do that. You know, the, the A minor Bach second movement. I mean, normally that would be a really beautiful shift, but in Bach, even as, as late as Mendelssohn, I mean, if you... You know, if you slid into those pitches, it, it sounds a little cartoonish. However, you get to those mid-1800s and later, totally different style. I mean, this is okay. You know, you can slide right into that note. Whoops. <laughs> You know, you can just, you can slide into those new pitches and it sounds okay. And, and in fact, it sounds stylistically good and, and we like that. So I, when I teach, I teach the classical style first before that reason is since it's sort of easier to shift into the pitch, you know, because it's a safety net to hear that note coming, then I think that can be detrimental because then you're, you know, you get so used to it, you don't want to learn the other style. So I teach the classical style first. Once a student has had a really solid foundation with that, then we can learn the romantic style. And because it, you know, it is kind, in the end, it is sort of easier, it's easy to learn. So I hope, I hope you are practicing your classical shifts and there are, oh my gosh, you know, all kinds of shifting books that reinforce that. I mean, in fact, that's all you have, really. If you have your Yoast shifting or Whistler shifting, these all these method books teach the, the classical shift. So this question is about developing good intonation when you are first learning to shift or to play in a different position. Because, you know, chances are you might have already spent a couple of years in first position and now your hand is in a new position. And there's this great, uh, it's, it's, it's written in the foreword of some old book. And, and, and the, the author says, every time you shift up to the neck of the instrument, it's like you're playing on a smaller violin. I love that. It's so true. By the time you're up here, it's like you're playing on a 16th size violin because as we go up the fingerboard, this distance, the spatial distance between notes, pitches, fingers, decreases, gets smaller. And the, you know, that, that disparity in, in distance is, is, is slight. It's not very pronounced if you're just going from first position to third position. So it's kind of hard to really have a, to feel it in a, in a real distinct palpable way. So when you're working on new technique, it's really good to just do things in isolation so you can bring all your focus and, and thought. So if, I think if you, you do this exercise, you can expand this and you can do it in other positions, other keys, other notes and other strings, but just play your one four, perfect fourth between one and four. And as you do this, sort of try to be aware of the overall feel of your hand. So tune your first finger on the A string to your open E. Tune your fourth finger to your open E. And just say, okay, hmm, first position. And this is what my hand frame feels like. This is, this, the overall feel of this is, for me, it feels kind of expansive. Now I'm gonna to shift to third position. I'm gonna tune my first finger to my open D. I'm gonna tune my fourth finger to my open D. And you might have to wiggle around a little bit.
little different. Okay, and then you're gonna fill in in between those fingers. Start with a major tetrachord. That's the first four notes of a major scale. And before you play it, imagine hearing the notes. Imagine where your fingers go. Imagine seeing the spatial distances, how they feel. So we're gonna be going. Okay, so I'm gonna imagine my fingers before I play. And now I'm going to shift. Play my perfect fourth. Imagine the notes in between. Imagine what they feel like. Imagine seeing them. Imagine if they were little birds on a, on a telephone wire, what they would look like perched next to each other. It's like, oh, there would be a whole step between one and two. There'd be a whole step between two and three. And three and four would be a half step. Okay, so that kind of practice where I'm trying to be aware of everything and I am observing, I am making note, I am chronicling every, every little thing that I, I notice about that. So I think with practice, your hand will adjust and it will learn those spacings so that you know you 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 will have good good intonation. And this question is about how to improve string crossings. Now this is a very broad topic, and so without really seeing what's happening, it's hard to to target what exactly what you're experiencing. So all I can do is just to give you kind of a, a piece of really good general advice, and and that is to prepare. Always prepare your string crossing. So. In the bow stroke, prior to crossing the string, you want to be making a subtle, organic, smooth string change in the shoulder. Now, if you're doing super, super fast string crossings back and forth, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about your average string crossing. So I think this is a really good example. I think a lot of people beginning uh, will, will, will have played this, this little minuet. So we have string crossings, right? A string, E string, A string, E string, E string, D string. So what I want to be doing is I, I want my shoulder to be in the background and it is going to be constantly preparing and anticipating the string change before I get there. All right, so I'll do this in slow motion. So I'm on the D string and I'm gonna drop to the A string right away. Well, I'm not gonna wait until I actually have to be on the A string to drop. Okay, that would be abrupt. So as I play that first down bow, I'm already gonna drop, already. My hand still stays on the D string level, but my shoulder is already gonna be dropping to A string level. Okay, now I have a really tiny way to go. Okay, because my shoulder is already down there. Okay, now I'm staying on the A string so nothing happens. On this stroke, I'm already gonna drop to the E string level, already. Now I'm there, it's really easy and simple to just then bring the hand to the E string. Okay, I have to go to the A string right away. So as I play this up bow, I'm already gonna be lifting to A string level with my shoulder. I have to go to the E string again, I'm already gonna be dropping. Nothing happens here. I'm staying on the E string, play the E string, and now I'm gonna be lifting my, preparing my shoulder and going to the D string at the end of this bow. Okay, so now I'm gonna do it without talking, and I'm gonna exaggerate the shoulder movement, and I'm gonna do it slow, so hopefully you catch it.
Okay, now I'm not gonna exaggerate and I'll play it a little faster. Okay, so this is always just in the background, the shoulder. It's like, where are we going? All right, I'll get you there. Okay, it's all, it's doing its job so that the hand and the elbow can do its job, which is this. It's all it has to be concerned about. That's how you make tone. That's how you're gonna pull the string to vibrate, okay? It just, it goes about its merry way and it is unaware, it is unaware that the shoulder says, oh, we're going down here now. We're going up here, okay? So I think just that's, I think my best piece of advice to immediately improve string crossing. This question is about tension in the shoulder. Now, our, the questioner did not specify which shoulder. I'm assuming right shoulder, bone arm shoulder, left shoulder, that's a setup issue. You have to work that out for yourself. If you, are, if you don't have a shoulder pad at all, and, and some people do play comfortably without a shoulder pad, but if it's not working, then you have to get something that's working. Now, I, there is a question here in this Ask Me Anything video about all that setup. So refer back to that if you're talking about that shoulder. If you're talking about the right shoulder, then there are a lot of things that can, can contribute to that. So without specifics, I'm not sure if I'm gonna target exactly what, you know, give you what you need. But in general, I think that the, the, the comfort of the right shoulder will happen if a, the bow hold is relaxed. So if, I, if you have stiff, a stiff bow hold like this, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. You're gonna have a bad tone and a stiff tone. And then when you start to hear bad sounds, you the instinct is to kind of back off. You want to not make so much sound. So then you unconsciously carry tension in the shoulder. Okay, let's say you have a great bow hand. The other thing is if you don't understand the physics of tone production and your bow, and this often happens, is too close to the fingerboard and you get sounds like that, then again, instinctively, you want to back away. And the first thing people do is to kind of lift their shoulder because you're trying to be delicate. You're trying to like not make bad sounds and so you're just holding this tension. So if you understand that, you can have a lot of weight and a lot of pressure. We could put an, an enormous amount of force onto these strings with the bow if we are putting it in the right spot. So if you're close enough to the bridge, I can, I can play with a pretty, I can get a big sound and I can put a lot of pressure. It allows me to let my, my shoulder be really heavy. If you don't know what a heavy shoulder feels like or what that or what a relaxed shoulder feels like, here's a really good little trick. And I'm this actually I've already made. It is gonna be a YouTube video all by itself. And it's just a quick little check-in here just to start communicating with your shoulder, see if there's tension there and get it out. So just just to on purpose, on purpose, start lifting your shoulder with the goal of touching your ear with your shoulder. So you just start lift, lifting and lifting and lifting and do this really slowly. The more slowly you do it, the more aware you become. And then at some point, you know, okay, I, I do it more, slow, more slowly than this. All right, I'm just, for the sake of this demonstration. So uh, get up there until your body and your shoulder and everything goes, ugh, please stop it. And then hold it a few more seconds. Then start to let it down. And the goal is, again, slower and slower and slower and slower. And you want to draw this out as long as possible. You want to be aware of how many levels of tension. It's like, even though I'm dropping my shoulder, there's still tension in the shoulder. You're still going to drop. You're still going to go down. How far can you go? How far can you go? How far can you go? And I go until my shoulder blade back here pops out. Kind of just, it kind of pops and then everything is hanging now and bouncing and it's real buoyant because now I'm using the back. That, that is a relaxed shoulder. And you will get more sound than you knew you could. 
Make sure that bow hair is close enough to the bridge, okay, so that you don't get a bad sound, because then if you get a scratchy sound, you're going to want to back away. So this question about how to practice effectively, I mean, that's a really enormous, enormous to topic as well. But I think what you're really getting at is, you know, you are, you're hitting plateaus. And we all tend to do that. You, you know, as we're learning notes and as we're figuring it all out, there's a lot, there's a, you know, big learning curve and you feel some progress. It's like, you know, yes, you can play it a little faster today than you could last week. And at some point you sort of hit the ceiling of your ability. And, and it's like, okay, what, what do I do to push past that? I think one of the things that people just don't use enough, even though we have it at our disposal, and that is, and I know you've heard this, is to record yourself. I mean, for real, record yourself and don't watch, go do something else, come back, just turn it on and listen just kind of passively as if you were someone else is playing and you're trying to, you just listen objectively and you're like, oh, what's that? And then you might hear something that you didn't notice when you were playing because really our brains, I think they, it craves sameness and pattern and routine and it just gets, always gets into ruts in the way it, as far as how we think about anything really, including how we're playing a piece. So you need sort of fresh perspective and that's so helpful. And, and just listen, I, I, I do this. So I, if I'm recording something for Violin Lab and then I, the next day, it always helps actually to put a day or two between your, your recording and listening to it. And then I just sort of turn it on and I'm just listening just to the audio. Don't, don't, don't watch a video because you're gonna be distracted by other things. And just listen. And sometimes I'll be like, seriously, like I didn't know I was not sustaining through that phrase. I mean, you, you, you'll hear things that normally you're not gonna be aware of. And then you have your music close by and you make some notes and then you know what to do. Another thing to do is, and I, I like doing this, I always feel that I play a little bit better if I juxtapose immediately. And I don't mean like you listen to a great recording or a great performer and then at some point you work on your piece. I mean, you are standing there, you're ready to go. You click play, watch, I don't know, Hilary Hahn or Joshua Bell. You watch someone perform, a really good performance. You listen, you, you do it. And try to imitate it <clears throat> as if you're learning a language and the native speaker is speaking in the language and you're like, you're trying to form the words in exactly the same way and you're trying to capture the accent in exactly the same way. So just juxtapose that. And I think that's a, actually a really helpful learning tool and it'll kind of help break out of sort of that, that stasis that, that you can you know, find yourself in. And, and then of course, you know, a lot of people like to just stop playing a piece for a while, a month or two, and then come back and you, and as you've worked on other things and hopefully your skills have improved, you kind of also have, have some fresh perspective. But those are just a few things to try. The strings I'm using now are the Larson Virtuosos. I really like them. I also change strings a lot. I change brands just cause, cause it's fun. I'm like, huh, this is new. Especially if there's a new, a new product that's hit the market, I gotta try it. I, I mean, I do tend to like the most expensive ones. Um, but it could just be psychological, you know, because, oh, if this is, you know, over $100 for a set, then, oh, it must be great. But anyway, yes, but right now the, I'm using the Larson Virtuosos. Oh, however, I do use the same E string, and I will never not use this E string for the rest of my life. I use the Kaplan Solutions. It says right here. I don't think you can see that. Let's see. No, probably not right here, solutions, non-whistling. Cause you know, you know how sometimes you hit the E string and it just squeaks for no good reason. Isn't it, it's not your fault. There, there, there's a physics, it's, it, there, there's, it has a term. Something is setting the string to vibrate in some weird way. I don't know, but all I know is it, it just whistles. So rather than be frustrated, I just use this string and it doesn't whistle ever. So this is the Kaplan, 
medium tension, aluminum wound. So wound, that's also key, not just those little pieces, those wires. Um, but yeah, the solution's non-whistling. That, that, that's a must have. It is how to make double stops clearer when you're playing on two strings at one time. And without seeing you play, I would just, if I had to put down money, if it's like, okay, here's $100 and here's your bet, what are you gonna put it on? I would say that more than likely, you are too close to the fingerboard with a little bit too much pressure. First of all, you're probably concentrating on the left hand. You're trying to get, you know, your double stop in tune. And so then you're, you're not really paying attention and your bow is traveling too close to the fingerboard. And since you're playing on two strings, I think on a subconscious level, your arm is like, oh, I've got two strings to play on. I'm going to have to work a little harder. So then you're adding a little bit too much pressure anyway. And it takes nothing. It takes absolutely, I mean, just a little bit too close to the finger. I'm not even on the finger, but I'm just here. And, and the sound just crashes. I mean... So, lighten pressure a little bit, move close to the bridge a little bit. It just takes a little bit and I think it'll clear right up. So this question is about, I think, up bow staccato playing, you know, staccato notes on one bow. That sort of thing. And, you know, the first thing I, I really want to say, don't underestimate that any kind of specialty technique like that requires a very rarefied, you know, type of strength and cooperation from a handful of muscles. What I'm trying to say is that it's not so much the mechanics, the how-to, it is that you have to do it enough that you strengthen the exact right muscles for the job because there is nothing else you are gonna do in your day ever that will bring that kind of strength. So, like vibrato, for instance, you know, you have, you know, the, the muscles in the forearm, everything, or even, you know, here, if you have an arm vibrato, are very, 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 very specialized. So same with, you know, up bow staccato. So if I do this every day, well, guess what? It gets easier and it gets faster. If I don't, then guess what? It's slower and it feels like a little more effort. Okay, so the first thing is, is to do it enough that you really can kind of build the, the right, the musculature for it. The other thing is, you know, just understand that all this is, is a game of catch and release. I mean, it's just a matter of friction and the release of it. So the bow has to grab the string enough, the, the, the hair has to grab enough so that you get the, the attack of the note. So it requires pressure and you have to create pressure somehow. And then the release of that is the release of mus muscle tension more so than a directional force. So it's like if I lean into and push in so that you can see the stick kind of wiggling there. If I have enough lean to create enough, enough friction, okay, so kinetic energy, nothing's going anywhere. Then if I just scoop my arm, what happens? I have to stop it again. So this, with this kind of energy, this directional energy where I'm gonna just close my elbow really fast and then stop it again because I have another staccato to do, it results in this little rebound, like, little, like a hiccup. Ribbit, it sounds like a ribbit, it sounds like a frog ribbit. Okay, so instead, I have to release. I just want to I'm leaning in, and now if I release the muscles, something's gonna happen. Okay, now I, I don't have any energy behind it. I'm just releasing. Okay, now if I put just the, the teeniest bit of direction to my release, so I'm pressing and I release, and now what I, and here's how I'm gonna do it. Okay, I'm just gonna, a little nudge. It's like, come on. Like you have a little frog and you're in a frog race and you're like, come on, come on. You want to just nudge the frog to jump a little bit? I'm sorry, that, it just, that, that visual just popped into my head. So lean in. Okay, here we go. Here we go. And 
then you realize it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much leaning. And, and the muscle right here, right there, that's your leaning muscle. So you just kind of, just with the index finger, you just kind of lean in a little bit, a little nudge. And again, just keep doing it, keep doing it. So our next question is about finding the perfect balance, that Goldilocks balance between bow speed and bow pressure. So I think everyone knows that bow pressure is how much weight is, is you are exerting on the strings and then bow speed has to do with how fast the bow is moving across the strings. Now the thing is, is you can't have the conversation about those two things. You have to include the third component for tone production. I say there's four, but there are three main ones. So the third big one is sounding point, where your bow is traveling, whether it's traveling here, whether it's traveling there. So think about, so the hair, okay, we're, I'm gonna, I'm gonna analogize here in a minute, but the hair has to grab the string. It has to pull the string. So the little fibers on the hair, they, they pull the string and then they let go. And this happens many, 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 many times over the course of a bow stroke. Okay, the string is being pulled and let go, pulled and let go. And that's what creates the vibrations. So if something is preventing the, the hair to grab, okay, then it's really not gonna make much of a sound. And we create, we, we, the, the, the hair is able to grab because there's friction. And we have to add rosin to the strings to create friction. Otherwise, it's not really going to grab very easily. If you were to put a lot of oil on your bow hair, you would immediately notice the absence of friction and you would get no sound. So these are the components. And, and if you really understand the science behind it, and it's not complicated science, something we can logically infer and understand, then you know what to fix. You know how to find that balance. You know, you won't even, you won't even have to think through it. You'll get it and you'll know what to do. So just imagine, you know, two trees and you have a rope and you're going to tie them around each of the trees and you're going to tie it really tight. So it's pretty, the rope is pretty taut. It's stretched pretty tight. Now, let's say you were tasked with making the rope vibrate and swing as wide as possible, where would you go? I think logically you would think probably in the middle. If you were to pull the rope in the middle between the two trees and let go, you would get a decent amount of movement. If you were to walk right up to where the, where one of the, the trees where the rope is fastened and you grab there and pulled, you probably wouldn't affect the string all that much. It would take an enormous amount of strength to get the rope to move back and forth, okay, from one of the fixed points. So that makes sense. Now, in this analogy, you know, one of the trees is the bridge, the other tree is the nut. So right here, right next to this tree, if I were to try to pull and push and pluck the string right there, it, there's a lot of tension, a lot of tension. I have to work harder, I have to work harder. Whereas here, I don't have to work very hard. I mean, you can see the string move easily. I can't really do that up here. There's just too much string tension right there. So the more the string tension, the harder you have to work. When it comes to using the bow, that harder work translates to more pressure. I have to, I have to add more friction. And the only way I can do that is, is to have a heavier arm, is to lean in, is to press on the bow. That's the only way I'm gonna get this string to vibrate enough to make sound, okay? So if I have just a normal amount of pressure, like I might have if I were playing down here, and that's all I had, and I was close to where the rope is tied around the tree, I'm gonna get that sound. Okay, just it's just it's just not enough force. It's not enough, there's not enough friction there, so I have to add more pressure. All right, well, the reverse. So let's say that I have a lot of pressure and I'm playing with a lot of pressure down here. Well, I'm gonna get a scratch. Because why? I mean, the string, there's not a lot of tension there. This is too much force. I'm bending the string, I'm squashing it, I'm preventing it from vibrating, it's just too much. The string says, get off my back, 
lighten up, will ya? So, you lighten up. Okay, and then there's everything in between. Everything in between. What does bow speed do? So what does bow speed do? You're driving your car, okay, and the road is kind of wet, and you just hit the accelerator, so the wheels start going really fast. What happens, right? Well, it's not grabbing the road. There's not enough friction, okay? The, you're just spinning out. Too much bow speed, same thing. So let's say I'm right here and I just have, okay, I'm getting a great sound, but I have too much bow speed. Well, it's all of a sudden, I'm going to lose friction. And it's just, it just won't grab. So I would have to keep adding and adding and adding and adding more pressure. You know, like, like that's why heavier vehicles will grab the, you know, the concrete better. So I have to have a lot of pressure. If I'm going to move the bow that fast, okay, and consequently, I'm getting a really loud sound. All right, let's flip it. Okay, so down here, I have too much pressure. I'm squashing the string. I'm prohibiting it from, from vibrating well. It doesn't like it. It's mad at me. But if I just pull the bow faster, I mean, it's going to reduce the friction that's happening right now. And if I lighten a little more pressure, then... Ah, there's my tone. So there's everything in between. Now there's a fourth component that I think goes undermentioned, and that is how much hair, how much bow hair is touching the string. So without even experimenting, I mean, like, what would you guess if I said, you know, would you have more friction with more hair or less friction with a lot of hair and vice versa? If I just had a little bit of hair, is that creating more or less friction? I think you would, I think you automatically know the answer. So if I have a pronounced bow tilt and I'm only using the edge, the outer edge of the hair, it sounds pretty clear and I'm actually kind of close to the fingerboard. Okay, now I'm going to flatten my, my bow and I'm going to use, put all the hair on there. I'm using about the same amount of uh, uh, pressure. Tilt. Okay, it clears right up. If I'm playing super loud and super heavy at the, the, the bridge and I need more friction, I need more force, it takes more energy to get the string to vibrate, what, what, what could I do to help that? So all I did was pull back a little bit. It helped flatten the hair. It helped bring more hair to the surface. Got more, more tension, got a little grittier of a sound. So consider that. Consider how much hair are you using and how can you use that to help find that perfect amount of friction, okay? And then lastly, the strings themselves. Okay, so Think about your ropes and your trees. If I had a big, thick rope, it would take a little more energy to get it moving. And if I had a thin little string tied around two trees, it would be easy. It would not be difficult at all. I mean, I could just barely pluck it and it would, it would, it would vibrate pretty easily. So there's more tension. There's more work that's required for G string, less work required for E string because the E string is thin. Remember that. Remember that. So if I am playing a loud, if, I'm, if I want to play forte, and I'm on the G string, it's a heavy string, I'm playing right here, I have a good amount of weight, I have a normal amount of bow speed, and that sounding point is, is, works. But if I do the same thing here, changing nothing, I'm just going to rock right over, too much friction because the string itself is thin and pliable 
and easier to pull. So when you are in higher strings and especially higher positions, especially on the E string, you have to make sure you are up here. Like don't overlook that. So many people do. And it's, they're just not getting a good, beautiful, clear sound up here. I mean, you have to watch. You have to look at that bow hair and go, you stay right there. Hillary Hahn does that when she performs. She's looking down a lot. I don't think she's looking at her fingers. I think she is, I think she's looking at her sounding point and she is looking at that bow hair and she is willing it. She's like, you stay there and don't you move because there's no forgiveness up there. Okay. So I think just review these concepts and experiment as you're playing. Think about, think about the string you're on. Think about, you know, what happens if you were to continue, say, using the amount of bow that you're using and the bow pressure that you're using, but move your sounding point, you'll immediately hear the changes and it will start to make sense. Once it makes sense, then you'll intuit what to do. You'll find that perfect balance, I think, pretty easily. Now, I'm combining these next two questions because they're about vibrato, kind of wrist versus arm, best way to start, hand size, how that might impact which vibrato to, to learn. I don't think hand size has anything, or certainly large hands would not affect or, or inform which vibrato to start with. I think oppositely, really small hands, especially on a large instrument like viola, it's better to do wrist because when, if your arm is already stretched out like this, to do arm vibrato is, is, is really awkward. I personally, I, I train you know, my students and on violin lab in my vibrato course, I do have exercises in both arm and wrist, but I, I tend to concentrate a little bit more on wrist development, smaller muscles, and the rocking motion of the wrist is less likely to interfere with the violin. There was the other question about violin shaking, and arm vibratos tend to sort of shake violins more. The wrist vibrato is, 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 is stays more you know, out of the way. I also just tend to think that it, it can get to a point of sounding nice, quicker. With arm vibrato, because there's these gross motor skills, and you know, I think for such a long time, people with arm vibratos, it sounds slow and it really is, it's just, it seems to take forever for it to get to the speed where it's really working, it's really sounding beautiful, less so with wrist. Wrist can speed up a little bit quicker because again, fewer muscles or smaller muscles and so this, this action, right, has the potential to go a lot faster than this action, okay? This is a lot more, the arm is a lot more work. Once you've developed a wrist vibrato, I don't know why, it's weird, but all you have to do is just contract just a little bit the bicep muscle. And if I just, okay, I'm gonna tighten my bicep just a little bit. And it just adds a little juice to it. Okay, it just gets it going a little bit wider and I can speed it up a little bit more. So I, I do recommend wrist. And then as far as the best way to learn it, more than anything, consistency, okay, don't skip even a day because as your muscles are developing and, and this, this very specific skill, you, you, have to, you have to be consistent with practice. I think sometimes people will try it and they get a little frustrated and they let it go and they come back and they try it, get frustrated, and it just never happens and it's because there's just too much space in between practicing vibrato. So you kinda gotta make sure you've got that time to commit to learning it. And then frequency, you know, not just every day, but just a little bit scattered throughout the day. Your muscles will develop and learn so much faster. 
And then while you're doing it, go for go for stamina. I see a lot of people who'll sh who will show me vibrato exercises and they'll be like, here's first finger, here's second finger, third, you know. But what I wanna see is how long can you keep it up effortlessly and with, with an evenly. I just wanna see this. You know, how long can you keep that going? So, so uh, stamina. And then lastly, the other, the other big issue, I think, is that when people are learning vibrato, they, they, get, they tend to get into certain patterns and habits with the bow arm, like this. You know, so they get in the habit of, you know, stopping the bow and then doing vibrato and then changing the bow and doing vibrato as opposed to really work for that independence where you can keep your right arm, okay, moving independently of your left hand. So once you are really starting to work with vibrato, and I think in my vibrato course, I have, you know, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> where, you know, you can start and stop it, even on one bow. Okay, so that will really, really will help with building that kind of independence. So this question has to do with, you know, the violin shaking when you're, when you're doing vibrato. And this is really common. This is a common question. And, you know, let's just kind of, I'm going to walk you through what I think is the problem and why. So first of all, let's just go with this assumption. I'm going to assume that you are plenty comfortable holding the instrument, that you have enough security between whatever's going on down here and whatever's going on up there. So that is not the issue because that's the first problem to solve. So let's say that you're very comfortable with your violin hold and now the issue is this. So, I mean, if you think about it, right? So when, if you're doing an arm vibrato or even a wrist vibrato, you are exerting a, you know, a pulling and pushing um, force on the instrument. And since we're touching the neck with our fingertip and our thumb, and some people are touching it here on the inside of the hand, so if, if, if the energy, right, from, from the movement of the arm is being completely transferred into the instrument because you have such a hold on that instrument, it's going to move the instrument, okay? So the only way to unlock it is to unlock the joints, all right, that are holding really, really still and really solid because that's how, that's why the, the violin is moving. So we've got to release the joints. Now, a lot of people think that if they do these kinds of exercises, that's going to take care of it. Well, it's not. Also, I don't think anyone has problems moving their fingers. I mean, we, we bend our fingers all day long. So that's not the issue. I think the issue is down here. So believe it or not, the base knuckle of your thumb is not there, it's here. Okay, so this, right, the base knuckle of the first finger is here, but the thumb is all the way down here. And this is what gets locked. So if this is locked, okay, then it is the, the movement is not going to manifest in the movement of the joints, right? It's not going to do this. Right? Because if I lock here, now it's all going to be, it's going to make the violin move. Even in wrist vibrato, same thing. So in a wrist vibrato, see how it open and closes here? See right here. But if I, if I have too much tension or squeezing, it's not going to move. And then look at my violin. So <clears throat> I think that the first step is just awareness. Just say, oh, joint. I haven't, I haven't even considered you. I'm so sorry. I've been ignoring you. I haven't really thought about you, but now you've got all my attention. <clears throat> so you're going to put your consciousness all the way down there and just tell your thumb, 
can you and you and, and and talk to your fingers and thumbs in this way always ask always always pose your thoughts in the form of a question and just say can you because usually you know the your your your, your thumb and your fingers are like yes i can they want to please they want to please you so it's like thumb can you release can you just have a light touch can you go any further can you keep releasing is there anything left can you possibly release e even even more tension and then once you feel once this is unlocked this is able to move now you can move this and guess what all that movement is happening in the joints and it's just rolling on top of the fingerboard the violin doesn't move you know and now i'm going to put my uh, focus right here i can feel this gentle little movement here i can feel the rolling a little bit here with my thumb and if i do arm vibrato i can feel a little tug here on the skin right that's good okay so that's absorbing all the the pushing and pulling from the arm or the wrist so that the violin doesn't have to, if that makes sense. Okay, I bet that's the problem. <laughs> now, someone has asked a question about keeping the bow straight when the wrist is not working properly. So I, I'm assuming that you've had some sort of a wrist injury. I guess the question is, does your wrist go, can, can you wave your hand? Will your wrist go up and down? because this is really the only direction, this is the only movement that the wrist is required to do. Not, we don't go like this. We don't go this way. Now, why does it sort of look like we do? That's because we're doing this, we are going up and down pronated. So there's a pronation, and now when you go up and down, then it, it, it looks, it, it provides horizontal motion. So I don't, again, I don't know if when you're at the frog, you can have a bend in your wrist. So try this, just, okay, you have your bow hold, right? Just roll and just try to touch the stick over here to the, to the strings to see if you can do that. If you can do that, then this should, should not be an issue. Maybe the issue is, is at the tip that you feel a lot of tension in your wrist to, to, you know, to, to have a straight bow and you have to extend and we kind of push out, push forward. So I don't know if this, this movement here puts strain in the wrist or you're unable to do that. If that's the case, then you might want to sort of kind of let go with these fingers when you get to the tip. You know, you can have a very elongated, you know, finger shape bow hold at the tip like that, and then your wrist can be a little straighter. So I don't have a lot of bend right now, okay? And, and I'm just barely hanging on here with the ends of the fingers. So the fingers are, are pretty straight. That helps with the extension. You can also work with your violin angle. So if you find, let's say, this uncomfortable, okay? Let's see, if you bring your violin more in front of you, and you're good, so we're gonna move everything this way. That might help, might, might alleviate some of the tension. So. So you'll want to adjust your shoulder pad so that the violin is kind of more in front of your, your eyes, your nose. And then I think there's a lot less stress and a lot less reach. So that would be less pull on the muscles. S see if that, that might help. And then conversely, if the issue is more of a bend this way, then doing the opposite pulling the violin more out this way, adjusting your shoulder pad or something so that you can have a, a further left leaning violin position. That, that would also help prevent stress in the wrist 
you know, when you're at the frog. Because if I'm, if my violin is this way, you can see how much my, my wrist has to bend to keep the bow straight. So I would work with these concepts and, you know, use a webcam, look in the mirror, see what, you know, what makes sense. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you're trying to, to keep a straight bow. If, if ultimately you feel it's not the wrist, that you are able to do this, you are, are able to bend the wrist okay, then it's, it's probably more of a bow mechanics and it could be more of a bow hold issue. So, but I would start there and then if you, if you still have questions, well, there's all kinds of ways to reach me. This person had several questions and I'm gonna start with the end, which is, you know, hmm, and this is a problem for a lot of people, especially I think males and uh, males who started a little bit later in life. And that is the, the difficulty of, of pulling around the instrument. And look, I don't know exactly, I really don't, I don't know how one could com completely get to where it is effortless to get the hand around. If I were to start playing the violin reverse and switch everything up, I would have the exact same problem. It would be such a stress and it would hurt so badly to, to turn my right arm around. So, but here's what I would be doing because I can even feel a difference by doing a lot of stretching. And like if I just pick the violin up and I start to play high up on the G string and I get my fourth finger around, it doesn't work well. It feel there's just it feels so effortful and laborious. And I know that if I just do a couple of things, it pretty it it instantly improves. So if you did these kinds of things and you felt any improvement at all, then let that be the hope to, so that you know that you can increase flexibility. But I wouldn't be looking for answers in any kind of violin videos. I would be going to like, I don't know, what yoga or other disciplines where, where stretching the entire body is, you know, is the discipline. So, but I know that when I feel that, if I stop and, 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 and if, if I just, if I just pull my arms all the way back, all the way back, all the way back, keep going, keep going. And I really get as much stretch here as I possibly can. And then I rotate my wrists really slowly this way and the other way. And if I do that, and then I also do, you know, these kinds of stretches as well. If I do those, and then I also do these. Especially with three and four, especially here. So you go this way, and then you go front and back, like, you know, their legs and they're, you're doing the splits, you know, stretch this way, this way, and then, hold your third and fourth fingers or your second and fourth fingers and push against your own hand, push against, and then stretch. If I do all that, it, all the, it feels easier. It, it just immediately feels easier. So try those kinds of stretches, all right, over a period of time. And like I said, if there's any degree of improvement, then at least you know you're on the right path, okay? But I don't know what specific stretches are ideal for, for improving pronation. I mean, except this. I mean, that this is what I would intuitively do. It's just I know for myself that the other, the shoulder muscles and, and these muscles here across the chest, that when they get tight, it feels like I can't turn my arms around as much. So, you know, and then of course, having, having more stretch in here just helps, helps you reach things better in general. All right, so the, the next part of the question is about Russian bow hold. And if the pinky is responsible for helping balance 
the weight of the bow. So if, you know, you can even just try this yourself. Hold the bow just about an inch above a string and, and let go, <laughs> let go with your pinky. You know, it's, the tip is going to just fall. The bow will hit the strings. So the, the, the pinky really is there to balance the weight of the frog. And then of course, when I'm at the frog and I am playing Dolce, it helps reduce that amount of hair or control it, you know, by, by putting leverage here at the end of the stick. Okay. So if you have a Russian bow hold, do you still do that? Because in a Russian bow hold, the, the, the balance of the hand is really forward. The, the contact point of the index finger is way up the stick. So the, the fingers are a little bit more mm, elongated. And then the pinky is kind of up here, not doing all that much, but here's the truth. It, it, it still is, and it still can be a major player in your bow technique. It's just not as, I think, it's not as easy to control because it doesn't have a wide range of, of motion. So, but, but it doesn't matter. I can still use it. I'm still using it. It is still there. Okay. I mean, and try that, try, try the experiment from earlier with your bow hold. If I'm assuming you have a Russian bow hold, you know, hold your bow up and then remove your pinky. What happens? I mean, probably the stick falls, you know, pretty much out of your hand. So you probably are using it. When it comes to, I would say, you know, kind of articulations where we need to be clean and exact. Like I, I have the Sebchik Opus 3 lessons on Violin Lab, and it's a series of, it's a theme and variation. Sebchik wrote this, I am sure, to develop advanced technique in his students, but... Um, <laughs> Okay, so this mo motion here, the cole motion, I'm really using my fingers to move the bow. So if I'm not using my fingers, right, if I am, if I did have a Russian bow hold and I'm mostly not, I don't have that same flexibility with the fingers, then I am gonna have to use more of my arm. And it's just a little clunkier when it comes to that kind of precision. Doesn't mean it can't be done. It's just in my experience, it's just in my experience, and, and the, the few, few people, colleagues, that I've known who've had a Russian bow hold, I didn't think had that precision of contact, of articulation, particularly with things that happen down here at the frog. So that's my two cents. And yeah, I, I, but I do, but I, it's, it's not that it can't be refined and it's not that you can't play beautifully with the Russian bow hold, you certainly can. So this question is, is about what to, what ideally should beginners be really focused on? So if, if you're in that three to six month period of time, that means that you've already practice, been practicing your bow hold and your left hand. You probably have been playing some beginning tunes. So do you take you know, the rabbit or the tortoise, the hare or the tortoise route? Do you really focus on technique and make sure everything is perfect before continuing? Or do you try to you know, get through books? Some teachers, some, some teachers I notice, I have noticed, tend to think that students will lose interest if they make them focus too much on technique. So they want them to have the feeling of moving forward and momentum by sort of, all right, let's move to the next piece, let's move to the next piece. The problem with that is that at some point, your technique is not going to, to be robust enough to keep progressing and you're gonna hit a wall, a hit a ceiling if you haven't addressed the technical issues. So I, I guess if I, if I am really, you know, having to say what I think is the most important thing to, to concentrate on, I would just say bow technique, bow mechanics, bowing straight, getting a good tone, 
being able to do to make a really good quality detaché stroke detaché stroke which is just going back and forth because if you get the bow mechanics right then you have no ceiling right especially to your to your right arm left hand will come along okay intonation will improve you will learn to shift you will learn to do vibrato those those kinds of techniques just require effort right but once you've established any sort of bad habits in the right arm they they tend to never get better on their own and i on violin lab i there's a technique that i teach right away so my whole gig is i teach the habits the 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 prof the muscular habits <laughs> i can't even remember my own tagline the muscular habits of professionals so I, when I was deconstructing and creating the curriculum, it's like, all right, what do professional players do that beginners do not do? What are the precise movements? What exactly is happening in the hand with this muscle, with this muscle, with this muscle? And why not, why not teach it to beginners? So hmm, I was right. Beginners can learn. Beginners can learn sophisticated bowing technique. So the, the very first thing I teach, you know, once the bow hold is correct, is, is this motion right here. Okay, I call this finger motion. Well, not just, I don't just call it that. Others call it that. Because if you can create a seamless, healthy change of bow from up to down, you're already winning the game. You are already miles and miles and miles and miles and miles ahead of what most beginners do. Miles. Years. We'll just say years. We'll put it in real terms. Okay, so you are years ahead. This next question is, is a big topic. Okay, it's pretty broad, and it's about how to get good at knowing whether you're in tune or out of tune. And I, I'm going to try to give you just some some ideas or I want to clear up honestly I want to clear some things up for you so you don't feel so frustrated about it and you at least have a launching point a place to start so here's the thing I mean most people myself included cannot say exactly whether they are perfectly in tune or not in a vacuum, in isolation. I can just pick up my violin and I can play a B. I think I'm really close, okay? I don't know if that's exactly a B according to the equal temperament chart. I don't know if that B was exactly in tune based on the tuning of my open E if that was exactly a perfect fifth for my E, you know, I, I know it was very close because I know what my hand is supposed to feel like. So that knowing whether you're in tune or not comes from context cues, all right? You just get really, really, really good at the context, at knowing how to use context to establish whether or not you're in tune. So when you are tuning your instrument or the, the, the teacher tunes your instrument for you, they're just, they've gotten really good at, you know, using tools. So again, most people do not ha have perfect pitch. I can't always, sometimes maybe I get it lucky, but if I were just to go, hey, okay. I mean, I've just had the violin in my hand. See, I wasn't right and I don't have great vocal control either, but so I, I, I thought that was sort of an A and it sort of wasn't. I need, I need a fixed object, something to compare it to, or I need an app or something to tell me where I am in regards to my A. Once I have the A in tune from there, I use context. Now, if you can hear this, and I'm just gonna demonstrate this, if you can hear this, then you're okay. You will be able to develop good intonation. 
If you can't, then then I might say to you, okay, well, I don't know. Maybe this this is too much of a challenge, but I'm going to play an A. I'm going to play another A. Okay? I'm going to play them together. I'm going to make them out of tune, and then I'm going to make them in tune together, and then I'm going to make them out of tune, and then I'm going to make them in tune. And if you can notice the difference, then you can learn to tune. Okay, you ready? Those are two A's. Could you hear that they were out of tune? Could you hear that they didn't blend? Did you notice what's called beating? Did you notice that? Did you hear the yeah, 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 And I'm assuming this mic is picking that up. I'll go back and check just to make sure because my ear certainly picks it up. Okay, now I'm going to, from there, I'm going to go back to being in tune and I want you to tell me what happens to the beating? Okay. really cool <laughs> so it got slower as as my second finger on the D string as I was getting closer to the frequency that was my open A those the beating started to slow down until it disappeared okay this is an auditory phenomena this is what happens in our ears and brains when we have these frequencies that are not quite right and then the the the, the interference with these waveforms that are just kind of going out in the air and then coming back, hitting the wall, come back and hitting our ears are not quite the same length. And then, then they create these spikes and these troughs, which is essentially really kind of loud and soft, loud and soft. And it comes out as sounding like, yeah, 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 like that. That is a, that is just a human ability. That is not a musical talent. So if you can hear that, and if you could hear when it was correct, it will take a lot of work, but you will be able to know if you're in tune or out of tune. You go from there. You go from there. So the same phenomena with octaves. If I, and I've demonstrated this in other answers, but I want, I'm, I'm still listening for that same placid sound of frequencies whose wavelength wavelengths are in proportion to each other in the right proportion to each other so for octaves it's two to one so unison what I just demonstrated was one to one those wavelengths were supposed to be the same okay so we'll do the same thing obvious but I imagine you hear that kind of friction it's it just to me it just kind of you know ooh. although I kind of like it because it's so satisfying when it goes away that I enjoy it So that is something you can start doing now. Every piece that you're playing, if there's a third finger in, in the natural position, so C natural, G natural, D natural, A natural, 
check it with your open string, with your below open string. Now you can't do it on the G string because we don't have another string down there, but start to become perceptive. It's an awareness that you can get, you can hone. Okay, so it's just getting more perceptive, perceptive to that. And then you can do other fingers as I demonstrated. You demonstrate the first finger with your higher open string, um, four fingers with open strings. And, and, and I, another question that I already answered was, you know, what, what do I wish I had done differently, you know, as, as a young student? And it would have been that. It would have been that. It would have been to increase my intonation perception by you doing those kinds of, of that kind of practice and being that aware. So look, don't despair. I mean, I, I get, get in touch with the instrument by doing that. And then what you will also eventually, hopefully start to also develop is a perception of your tone based on the timbre of your instrument when you are in tune. And what I mean by that are the ring tones. You probably understand that. So, you know, if something is in tune, let me do, go back to my A's, right? So if this is in tune, I'm not playing my open A. I'm playing the D string right now, but it's pretty ringy because my, it's making my A string ring. Watch, let's see. So I'm gonna play on my, I'm gonna play the D string but I'm gonna touch the A string with my pinky and you can hear. So that little ping sound is me stopping the vibration of the string that's happening because it's vibrating sympathetically. Same with like the G. So my G string is also vibrating. I'm not playing on the G string, but it's vibrating sympathetically. Okay, so I, I get to know the instrument. Really just, just listen and listen for the resonance of pitches when they are in tune. Listen to how your violin sounds, okay? And I think you'll start to develop more perception of it. So this question is about vibrato, about overcoming fear of learning vibrato. And, you know, you're not alone. I think a lot of people do find, you know, starting vibrato very daunting. And especially if you've tried it a little bit and it just doesn't seem to work or like, I don't think it's ever going to work. I've taught vibrato to many, 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 many adults. And I will just tell you that every person who perseveres learns it. I've never had a failure. If anyone doesn't learn it, it's because they don't do it. Like they don't want, they end up just saying, I don't need vibrato, or they just delay ever starting it. But every single person that starts and stays with it learns it. Okay, there are different timelines. Some, some go super fast. I've had a couple of adults, 30s, you know, that have learned it in like three weeks to a month. That's kind of a record. And then I had one student, it took her about a year and you know what? She got it. In the end, everyone gets it. So, I mean, just know, know that, know that you, there, if you do it, you will learn it, but you have to be regular about it. And, and there are so many steps, you know, in, in the course that I created, I start with just very simple exercises just to build the muscles of the forearm, you know, because you've got to build the motor first, I think. And it, it will not happen if you just put your finger down and say, okay, well, I think I'm supposed to rock my hand back and forth or move my hand. You know, it's, it really is daunting to just to try to do it. So, you know, you just start easy and I have these little accompaniment exercises and you can do this and I don't know, you can do other things while you do it. But it's just to build, just to build the muscles, just to be able to sustain this sort of action. And then you slowly add pressure and over time, the muscles just learn. They just learn what to do and, and it really happens. So I, I don't think that you 
are necessarily at a place where you must learn it. So don't feel like, uh uh-oh, if I don't learn it now, then I'm missing some window. So that's not a thing. Um, it, there's not like some ideal window for learning vibrato. I think there's such a thing as too early for sure. Beginners are not really ready to learn that skill yet, but I mean, you could even continue, get back into playing, get a good routine, start just to feel strong again. And then, you know, even Suzuki, Suzuki book four or end of three, you could start. But, but yeah, don't, so don't let that be a stress. Just the only thing you have to decide is, okay, how much time am I going to dedicate to doing this every day? That's it. It's got to be consistent, as I mentioned, and you probably are watch, going to watch the, uh, my other responses to vibrato questions, but, but it really is consistency. That, that, that is, that's the only way the muscles will learn. You can't let them go cold and lose their tone, and then they have to kind of start all over again. So just little bit several times every day until you get it. The person that asked this question is around finishing book uh, Suzuki book two is without a teacher and has asked about kind of what to do I guess in a if you're self-guiding. Um, Suzuki at the end of Suzuki book two in my opinion is is a kind of a crucial time because I think that is the right time to start developing the techniques that are, that's going to take you from sort of intermediate playing into advanced playing. So shifting, vibrato, articulation studies. And, um, I mean, I have all those studies and resources and everything in my curriculum on violin lab, but if you're, you know, determined to, to go it alone, then make imslp.org your best friend. There are some really great books that will introduce these techniques. The Sebchik Opus 2 um, is wonderful because it ha- they have you know kind of a gentle melodic phrase and then you have all kinds of bowing variations. And the, the Maya Bang uh, Book 3, and I'll list these links, the Maya Bang Book 3 has, uh, is, introduces third and second position. So I think now's a really good time to, again, just start the process of understanding and being able to play in positions. On Violin Lab, I have first, we we learned some foundational shifts. So I have my students and members get really good at being able to just transition from, you know, first to third position and and be really aware of the interval, okay, that you are spanning when you go from position to position. So if you're just going first finger B to D, that's a minor third, okay? So first step is sort of you do all the minor third shifts on all the strings, and then we get to the major third, and then the perfect fourth, because once you get these foundational shifts, you can, it, it just, all the shifts, harder shifts are based on these foundational shifts. So I say now would be a great time to delve into that. Shifting um, bow work with the Sebchik Opus 2. And and as far as vibrato, you know, there are many ways to go about doing this. I have a vibrato course. It's both in on, in, on violinlab.com platform, but also I have a standalone that's just a single time purchase. And then you can go through the entire course. I start from just developing the musculature for vibrato because that's the most important thing. You have to build the motor because you want your motor to be, you know, like a Maserati strong to where you can sustain this oscillation easily, you know, and with, with absolutely no effort. Okay. So starting like that, I have some beginning slides and taps and then you graduate to where you're keeping fingers down so there's a whole course again you don't you don't have to do you know have a course or something like that you can just start yourself you know you can do the exercises turn on a metronome and then just start with what i describe as the 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 foundation of a vibrato motion which is the ping forward and the rebound back It's a single action. It is not a dual action. 
this is this sort of seesaw, tick-tock, pendulum swing. It's not that. It is just a really quick, explosive ping forward, and then the hand just comes back. So you can, you can start that easily on your own. Also on imslp.org, just type in beginning methods or easy violin, and there will be only thousands of files for you to look through. There, to me, it is, it's my happy place. It's the treasure trove. It is like, you know, we just discovered underneath, you know, the sea, this, these, the, just this vast trove of music that you didn't know existed. And it's just like, I, I could spend all day long just clicking through files and, and seeing, and seeing music that I didn't know was published, you know, back in the, 17, 18, 1800s, and up to 1928, I believe. I think that's now the cutoff for public domain. But anyway, enjoy. You might find some things that remind you of some of the pieces you were working on, but there's no shortage of material out there. All right, I hope you find a lot of inspiration. So this question has to do about fiddling and fiddling style versus classical style, particularly with left hand position. So, you know, you see a lot of fiddlers playing like this and there seems to be no limit to how well they can fiddle holding the instrument with a bent wrist. Um, fingers can move fast, you know, this way accurately. I mean, for me, it wouldn't be so accurate, but you know, it, it does happen. Now, here's the thing. For classical technique, it's 100% a limitation because for the main reason is you will have to shift and, and which means you're gonna have to move your hand and then you have to straighten your wrist or else you can't get up the neck of the instrument. So that, I think that's the main reason. Also for me, just being able to change finger patterns. So like, let's say that you had to play a low first finger and then you have to stretch. I mean, to me, the fingers are not in an ideal way for, for doing that when your wrist is straight. I think you have a better ability for stretching and your fingers are more malleable and more flexible to, to meet the demands of classical literature, which requires oftentimes for you to change your note placement and finger placement instantly because the music is always evolving and fiddle music, like you're usually just in one key and you stay in one key. This is in the key of G. Okay, you're good. And that's that. But if you're playing Bach, you know, and all of a sudden you're in some weird tonality and then you're modulating and you have accidental. So I think that having a fiddle left hand is very limiting for classical violin playing. And I, I, I mean, it's just my observation, but great great fiddlers who are also great accomplished violinists, they hold their their instrument like a violinist, like a classical violinist when they fiddle, you know, like Mark O'Connor. He doesn't, he doesn't go back and forth and play, you know, Mozart like this and then, you know, I can't fiddle, you know, like that. So he keeps his classical postures for fiddle playing. So that it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt the fiddle playing to have a classical left hand. So I would just I would encourage you to play uh, you know like that. Now, why why it evolved? This I don't know except to say maybe that you know old time fiddlers and and the tradition is like you don't need a shoulder pad since you're not gonna be shifting and you're not gonna be playing you know really high, you're gonna be doing mostly tunes in first position, then you don't need one of these, and then you're holding your violin like this, and then if you do this, you know, you need more left hand support. I don't know. But anyway, I, I hope that answers your question and that you kinda of keep evolving more toward your classical technique so that you can do everything. Oh, and just to follow up, sorry, about the bow hand in relation to you know, sort of fiddle versus violinistic styles. And yeah, I think there's also big limitations that way too. So if, if you know, I see, I see all kinds of fiddle bow hands that, I mean, I don't even, I'm, sometimes I see them, I'm like, oh gosh. But, and they're just fine for, you know, faster, just plano detache styles. But for super legato, beautiful, lyrical 
uh, playing, I do think that there's a lot of limitations. So you really do have to have a very well-formed bow arm and bow hand to be able to create what is essentially the sound of seamlessness. So we really imitate, you know, operatic vocal style where, you know, you just have all this air you in that you just sustain sound for a long time. And for that, I do think you have to have a really proper classical bow hand. But, and again, in the reverse, I don't, the, I don't see any limitations um, for playing fiddle style with classical technique. All right, this question is about curving the pinky. I've got curved pinkies in first position, playing viola, and this is not just for violas. It's, it's harder on viola, but even, even with violin, especially if you have a short hand. So I do have some really strong opinions about this. Um, and I, I myself, th this is a struggle of mine because I have, I mean, you know, I have small hands, small little pinky. I mean, if I, if someone were to say, Hey, I will pay for any body modification surgery. I mean, you'd think at my age, I would go for a facelift or something, but no, I would say, okay, the only body modification I want, I just want you to add, you know, about a quarter of inch to my pinky. That's all I want. I just want to lengthen the pinky. So it is an issue, it, 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 but here's, here's what I want you to know. Here's what I really want you to know, okay? First of all, you can have a strong functioning pinky to play whatever you want, and it doesn't have to always be like this, okay? It is just not, this is not possible for me. I can't play, no. If I play an E right now and I curve my pinky, it won't be there. It'll be flat. I have to reach. I just have to. That's, that's all I can do. Okay, but when I'm in good shape and I'm practicing, it's really, it's quite easy. And, and, and the muscle, there, there's, there are muscles here that pull, that pull the finger. And then you have these tendon ligaments all in the fingers that can be very strong and it can be quick and just work just fine and you can still have vibrato. Now, about that, it's pretty universal that the, the fourth finger just is just doesn't get the quite the lovely vibrato that the other fingers get. And in fact, watch this um, Spiegel im Spiegel piece and Anna Akiko Meyer is the is the is the performer. Just watch this video. I mean these are just simple scales. They're just simple scales, you know. She never uses a fourth finger. And it's perfect I mean it's not so difficult. I mean, like, yes, fourth finger is the finger that you would probably use, but she avoids the fourth finger every single time because of vibrato, because she wants the same vibrato, because she wants her third, third fingers and second fingers and first fingers to do vibrato. Me too, <laughs> okay? So yes, if you shift to, if you have a long note and you don't want to sit there on a fourth finger, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that is the benefit of shifting. That is one of the reasons that we learn to shift so we can just do that and not have our slightly inferior vibrato on the fourth finger. So now there are other things that you can do <clears throat> that will help, help with, you know, making it a little more comfortable. And of course, I think you've already mentioned this, you know, bringing the elbow a little further under for fourth finger, the hand a little higher. Um, and, uh, but, but here's what you might not know and, and, and what you might not be doing. And just, just know this, that unless you have a really fast passage work, there's no rule that says you have to keep your first and second and third fingers in sort of a fixed location all the time. So if I, if I'm going to play, let's say I play first finger, second finger. Now, 
let's say I'm going to go to the fourth finger, and if I keep my first finger anchored back here, then my fourth finger is a little more elongated. But if I say, hey, I don't need, I don't have to keep my first finger there, I can release. Okay, now I've effectively given my fourth finger a little more leeway. Okay, and I've released here. So I have shifted the balance of the hand toward the fifth finger. I have, you know, unleashed, unleashed the first finger. And that, that's really important. Now, again, if you had super fast notes, you probably wouldn't want to do that. But, but just know that the hand is malleable and the hand position is flexible. When the hand is relaxed and you really do practice enough and you have a good sense of intonation, you know, you don't have to feel like, oh, these fingers, this hand frame, oh, if I veer from this, I'm gonna get in trouble. No, release, okay? So I hope that gives you, you know, I don't know, makes you at least not feel so frustrated about about fourth finger i mean look it is what it is and and we just have to keep working at it but more than anything strengthen it strengthen it it that really helps and and also i think i already mentioned this um stretching stretching is so good so good so like just and, and, and if you do this enough i mean it will start to make a difference and, and I do this if like sometimes I'll, if I'm practicing and I feel like I'm having to stretch a little bit or it's too much work to, to get fourth fingers, then I just do some good stretching here and then hold these together, push away, push out, push out, open, put, resist your, your right hand and now stretch. I mean, you will gain, you will gain real estate here. And, and even here, down here too. So just gentle, you know, just gentle stretches, opening that up so that reaching is easier. This question is about coordinating left and right hand when doing sautier, sautier, the, the bow stroke, you know, where the bow, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it looks like it's bouncing. It's actually not. It's actually just sort of going back and forth like this, and it just kind of scrapes the each side of the hair really fast. Now you can do a sautier so, so slow and so powerfully. You can get the bow to bounce, but anyway, that stroke. And coordinating it with the left hand. So that little spot in the chardas, that's, that's a really famous example of, of of sautier. And, <clears throat> you know, here's the thing, you know, you learn sautier and in a way it's kind of like it works at a certain speed. It's hard to change speeds with the right hand. So here's a slow sautier that you would never use. But just to demonstrate the bow stroke. Okay, so it didn't really work at that tempo. But you can speed it up and slow it down. And, and sometimes when people learn sautier, they just kind of learn it at kind of the whatever speed that they can do it at. It's just kind of this one tempo, one speed. So it's a lot to ask your left hand, like no matter what, you've got to keep up with the right hand. So the first thing is to try to be, is to be able to do sautier at different tempos. So it's not just one hand having to keep up with the other one. So it, that, that they both can work together to find the tempo that will, that will be successful. Another thing is that I think that sometimes the sautier stroke itself can, can create some tension in the right hand, which then of course is gonna make the left hand a little bit harder to control and it'll slow it down. So making sure that both hands are really relaxed and, and that's easier said than done. When you are learning sautier and hopefully you still do some good preparatory exercises. So the, the best is to just to do a, a very floppy small, little teeny amounts of bow, detache, 
in the middle of the bow. And when I say floppy, I mean floppy, fingers and wrist, very floppy. Okay, and I'm using, I'm, I'm, I'm letting it kind of scratch a little bit. I'm gonna flatten the hair a little bit. This is not how I would normally play 16th notes or fast notes, but as a good warm up to try to just make sure that the hand is super relaxed. Floppy, floppy, floppy. So if you're, if you're doing this, that's not floppy. So you have to start loosening your bow grip until the motion itself, the back and forth of the, of the hand makes the wrist do this. It's, a, it's as a result of having loose joints. So floppy, floppy. And then you start adding first finger pressure and you start adding a little bit more vertical motion to it. But you still try to keep the looseness in the fingers. So just to check in and make sure that you know your your sautier itself is is functioning well. And and then and here's the thing. You have to you have to be able to play the passage you have to be able to play it with the bow on the string coordinated this way so if 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 you can't do it that way it's probably not going to work with saute either so keep practicing it with the on the string very short very flexible tiny little bows floppy hand on the string stroke okay coordinate it that way first and then let it morph gradually into the into the sautier and then lastly is to in the end okay let's say that you kind of are doing all those things and it's almost there you know it's sometimes it gets a little blah, 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 blah. you have to have a an incredibly powerful beat pulse inside your entire being you have to be thinking like i mean i don't know if you've ever seen kodo drummers i went to a concert once and it was it was a very powerful thing right and and th these these performers have these big huge mallets and they are hitting drums and they are so huge and it is just like whoa. i mean it is it's very visceral and it's like there is a Kodo drummer inside going like this, you know, into your psyche. So that that's what is gonna ultimately bring them together, all right? So you are thinking, da 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 You know, okay? That will, that will, your brain has to have the concept in there, the concept of the beat. That's, that is what will govern the response and the, the movements, the muscular mu movements, right? So, so they will organize themselves. When I say they, I'm talking about all the muscles from both hands, will organize around, okay? So, I hope that works for you. So this question is about how to get rid of the bounces in the bows, as well as, you know, keeping the bow straight on the G string. The bows, you know, this, this person says that the bow tends to slip on the G string. Now, as, as far as getting rid of bounces in, in bow strokes, do refer to, I do have a whole video on that here on YouTube. So visit that because I try to go through you know, all, all of the possible causes of that. I think if there's one main cause, it is, it really is that there is a joint that something ha is not releasing and it is preventing the bow from really just sinking into the, to the strings from really grabbing. So it can be a thumb. If you have a bent, stuck thumb like that, it's gonna bounce. Even if you think you're not, it will still do that. So thumbs, 
underneath here, and the, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I, I don't think people ever, ever think about this. Um, the, the thumb is really, this thumb joint down here, base, base joint here, is a big shock absorbing joint. So when you, when you draw a down bow or place the bow, here's how your thumb really should be, not this. It should be this. It should be absolutely neutral and then place or down bow. See how it gives, see how it flexes down there? I mean, really, just think about your the car going over, you know, a speed bump. If you don't have that bounce and that shock absorption, it, it you know, it's just going to be so jarring. So I think I think that's very likely the cause. Again, there could be lots of things. This is definitely one of those symptoms that could have a variety of causes. Okay, um, so I think if do refer to that video, and that that should help as well. The G string, <clears throat> if the bow slips on the G string, if it's slipping this way, then it's just either you're swinging your arm back and forth, you know, and even if you think you're not, even if you, if, if in your mind's eye, you're like, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm opening up my arm. Chances are you're not actually pushing out in front of you. So I, I, preach this gospel. I mean, reach, not swing. Reach, not swing. So, you know, if I, I mean, you can't see my foot, <clears throat> but right now my hand is literally over top of my right foot, my right toe. It's not out to the side. <laughs> On the up bow, you do have to release. The, the, the pushing muscles that extend your arm forward need to let go. And if you don't know where those are, I'll tell you. Go back here, back in the back, back of the shoulder. Release them, let go, let go, let go. Reach forward, release in the back, fold back up. There could be other things in the way, but that's that's a good place. That's a good place to start. So this question is, has to do with the the wolf art etudes. Now, Opus thirty eight is a beginning method, and you know this was wolf art back in I don't know eighteen hundred sometime where he was like, okay, beginners, this like, I got to teach someone to play the violin. So here's a good way to do it. Opus 45 is like, okay, you've been playing the violin a while, so I'm going to give you some really good etudes that are really going to work on string crossings and bowing patterns and playing in specific tonalities. So they, it was not necessarily, I don't think, he, he intended to, I, well, to answer your question, okay, the short, answer, the short answer to your question is Opus 38 is not a prerequisite for Opus 45. In fact, I don't know anyone who uses, any teacher who uses the, the beginning wolf art method. I mean, it just, it was written for a long ago and there's been so many methods developed since then. Most teachers use the Opus 45 as supplemental material to whatever program they're using, you know, whether it's the ABRSM, whether it's Suzuki, you know, Opus 45, they're just, they're just good old etudes and it's great for developing sight reading and left-hand facility. So no, there is no reason why you can't use Opus 45 and other methods. Now, if all, if, if you had no other access, I mean, you were a beginner and you just got your violin, obviously you wouldn't go straight to Opus 45. Opus 38 is a primer. It is meant for beginning players, but one of the things about these old methods, like this wolf heart, is that I think that they're they are not as well designed in terms of um, building skill incrementally. So a lot of these old method books, like you'll have whole notes for three pages, and then all of a sudden you're, you have something kind of difficult. And so, you know, I've always wondered, it's like, well, what was in, what was in the mind of this person? You know, it's like, 
were they assuming that there were also other materials that teachers were using? Anyway, I don't know the answer to that, but no, it is not a prerequisite. You can certainly play Opus 45, but you do have to have a good method. On Violin Lab, I, I have taken some of the important Suzuki pieces that he uses, but I have filled in all the gaps so that every skill is being addressed on a beginning level. I also try to bring in other styles so it's not just Baroque. You know, I want to have some, something, things from the Romantic style period, lyrical pieces that are playable. So I have sort of just filled in those gaps. So then when I introduce Opus 45, it's in the intermediate section. And by then, you know, you're, you're completely ready for it. So this question is about, you know, dealing with, with sweaty palms. And, you know, I know, a, I know a lot of people who deal with that. I used to. Now, it's like my hands are so dry all the time. I'm like <sighs> doing the opposite. But, but when I was in college and, you know, I was having to perform a lot and, and play under pressure, I mean, I was always nervous and anxious and it just felt like my, my, my hands were always so sweaty. And, and for me, it was less about slipping as it was the sweat just made, it made my shifting unreliable. Like it might slide, but then it would stick and slide. Anyway, so I was constantly washing my hands. Like if I didn't wash my hands before I played, it, I would feel just so uncomfortable and oh, I just couldn't stand it. But I also brought powder with me. So I just kept a little thing of powder, like talcum powder, and I would just kind of put it on, on the palms of my hands to just kind of get them, you know, drier. Again, I, I can't imagine it now because my hands stay so dry, but if you do that, what I would, the one thing I would avoid is the thumb. Like don't, don't put any, any powder on your thumb because you do want that to be a little sticky anyway. But, you know, and, and of course there was like powder all over my fingerboard, you know, it was all over my hands, but I, that was what I used all the time and it worked. It worked. I, so I washed my hands, put a little powder on there and it was okay. So I hope, I hope that that is a solution for you. The question was about finding literature for solo violin to serve as good performance pieces when it's really hard to find, you know, pianists. We just can't, unfortunately, know a lot of people to say, hey, can you come and accompany me anytime I want? So th there's there's not a lot, there's not a, an, a, a ton of repertoire for solo violin because, you know, violin really sounds the most beautiful when, you know, you have harmony uh, surrounding it. So it, it, essentially, you know, violin is not a polyphonic instrument, it's a melodic instrument. But there are some good pieces, and I love the Telemann fantasies. I think they're approachable, they're doable, some more than others. The, the even number, the odd numbers, the odd numbers I think are more approachable, and I like them the most. So I actually teach number nine on, on my site, on Violin Lab. There are some really beautiful performances of, of these Telemons go to imslp.org and you know what would be a good place to search would be violin etudes or caprices so these are sort of written as etudes but they don't sound like etudes now i'm not talking about wolfhart and kreutzer and rode and any of those those are straight up etudes and they sound like etudes but there are a lot of etudes out there that actually are kind of nice. In fact, Mazas, Mazas etudes, some of them are very etude but some are not. So I would look at the Mazas etudes and find the most melodious ones, the ones that seem more like a composition than an etude. Um, but that would be, that would be a really great place to start. So this question is like, you know, do you always need a teacher? Once you get to a certain level, are you on your own? You know, can you teach yourself or do you always need a teacher? And I think, I mean, the, the, the answer is no. You, you should be able to be your own teacher because if you really have studied and you really have absorbed what you've been taught and you become very good at self-assessment and self-analyzation 
and, and understanding the technique, you should be able to teach yourself. I mean, I have not played for anyone 20 years. And now, that's not, that's not saying that still having a, an, a set of ears listening to you is not valuable. It really is. And I have colleagues who, before a performance, will say, will you listen to me and give me feedback? Because you can't be 100% objective, you know, with your own playing. I recommend recording yourself and listening back as if you were the teacher and this was your student and you were listening to them. Or, or you were just listening to a performance and listening as objectively as possible. But, but the goal is, is that after you have had the training and after you know how to deconstruct music and after you have developed really, really solid, solid practice techniques that you don't, that you don't need a teacher anymore. So this question, it was about, you know, having a good left hand posture and holding the violin up at the same time. So this, this viewer has, is not a hundred percent comfortable just with the shoulder and the neck. Now, please do refer back to in this video, earlier in the video, someone asked about setup and getting comfortable and support, getting good support with all this. And I, you know, demonstrate everything I've gone through to solve my own issues. So do, do look at that part. But I just want to talk about like the violin angle as well as just to say that you can still use your left hand to support the instrument. It's not that it can't be done. It's, I don't think it's ideal to use it as a primary support because then you will tend to want to anchor and squeeze a little bit. It just happens. It doesn't mean you can't overcome that. So there is, it is possible. It is possible to use only the inside of the hand, okay, as support and the thumb. People can play like this. You can still have this constant contact and constant support, and you can still use vibrato. It's just that I haven't yet seen a beginner player do this successfully. Like they haven't quite learned how to support the instrument yet still have freedom and flexibility in the hand. So I, I go to great lengths of explaining what good left hand posture is. And um, there, there's, a, there's a video on, on Violin Lab where I really talk about, okay, is it okay to have some space or not some space, you know? And, and it is okay that the, that the hand is touching the instrument. But in your case, you can go a little further and use it even more to support the instrument. It can be done, but likely your first finger is disappearing under the neck. And then likely that's pulling your wrist up a little bit. The problem with this though, is that, you know, your fingers, they're not hitting, they're not dropping from a more vertical uh, positioning, which will lead to faster playing and efficiency. Again, doesn't mean it can't be done. What I would like to see you do is is work with work with this. And I even earlier, let's see. I don't I can't remember if it's that question or another question, but please do search back in this video. And I even have some other solutions. I have I show a strap that I use sometimes to keep the instrument up because, you know, I do have uh, some muscular and vertebra issues back here. So check that out. Now <clears throat> for the violin angle, when, when I'm holding the instrument, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't look flat by any means. It's definitely tilted. I'm always surprised if I were to walk away, like just how tilted it, uh, can't really do this. Okay. Let me try this again. No, still not doing it how tilted it really is. And, and that's so that that's just for playability, ergonomics, being able to reach the G string more easily, right? So it's sort of a compromise. It would be easier to play on the E string if the violin were flat. It would be easier to play on the G string if the violin were vertical. So, you know, this sort of 45 degree angle allows us to get from one string, the low string to the high string pretty easily and, and still have gravity working with us. 
right? Because if my violin were too tilted, it'd be hard to play on this vertical plane. But here is what, here's what goes unnoticed and unappreciated, especially in adult beginners. What I notice is that adult beginners, well, I'm just going to say all beginners, I mean, even kids to some degree, feel like their body must be very still, like they're afraid of messing anything up. So it's, it's extremely common for me to see you know, learners playing like this. and not moving a muscle except for fingers and bow arm. And, and if you were to really start, start looking at orchestras, performances, and soloists, and you're gonna see something, you're gonna see movement, right? So movement accomplishes many things, but one of the things is to bring the string closer to the hand, right? Rather than saying, okay, my violin is at this angle all the time, and I'm just gonna have to move my right arm to accommodate that. But let's say that you're gonna ha you have to play on the G string a while, and you you're in higher positions like. Okay, now if I do this, so I just lean. I'm leaning. I'm bending at the hips, and I'm bringing that G string over here. And that is something that you, you will, you'll see across the board if you start looking for it. Conversely, on the E string, if I'm, I, I would, you would never see a performer, you know, when, you, when, when performers are on the E string, they're like this. They do the opposite. From the hips, they lean back like this flattening the instrument. So this is a pretty big range. And and kind of the, the rule is, is you don't bend in the waist. You know, you don't bend the spine this way and that way. You shift your weight from leg to leg, and then you can lean from the hips, okay? So if you need to play up on the E string, you're like this, and if you need to play on the G string, you're like that. And you're in motion, and, and, and that kind of movement helps the bodies, you know, stay relaxed. So don't forget that that, that, that really is a thing and, and start looking for it when you're watching performers perform. So I'm to my last response to this first, you know, ask me anything video. I really enjoyed reading your questions. I hope you are enjoying my answers and I will do it again. If you didn't get a chance to ask something or you have thought about something else as you've been practicing, then wait for the next one. Please do subscribe and click the little notification bell. I guess you get an email. I don't know how that works, but in any case, you would know when it's time to, uh, when I am, am accepting new questions. So last question is, this person, you know, played pretty extensively, I think six years and probably got, no, got to grade six, I think, in the ABRSM series, I believe. Well, all that is to say is you put in some time and now it's been a while and you're a little hesitant about getting back into it. And I think probably because you, you don't want to feel bad and you don't want to think, oh, you know, I, I have all that work to do again. Well, just so you know, it has not left your brain. Muscles, yeah. I mean, you cannot walk upstairs for three days in a row and then walk upstairs and you're going to feel it. I mean, the body, the muscles do have to regain their strength, but it goes faster than you think. It really does. So I think the first thing to do is, is just to start, you know, just say, all right, it's going to take me two to three weeks, all right, just to get my muscles toned again so that I, my bow arm doesn't get sore when I hold it up, get those calluses back get the finger action going. And you know, it's not pleasant. I hate it, honestly. But it, it, I'm always surprised at how quickly, at how quickly things start to sound better once my muscles are kind of back in shape again. I mean, it goes from, I can't even believe this. I can't, I sound like, you know, I probably did in middle school to, oh, right, I'm a professional violinist. And it's just muscle tone. So you know, give that it's three weeks or so. 
And then as far as what you learned, it, it will come back. Um, but what I would do, rather than trying to sort of pick up where you left off, do the opposite. Just tell yourself, I'm going to start all over again. I'm just going to start with book one. And then really quickly, you're going to be playing that and you're going to be like, yep, 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 yep. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go to book two and then you're going to start. Yep. I got that. So, and you'll, you'll just, you'll realize that you remember and can do more than you you're thinking you can because you're being fooled right now. You pick up the violin and, and it feels awful. And that's just because your muscles are out of shape. So you think you, you're, you've lost skill, but, but the pathways are still there. I promise. Um, like I, I back in 19, mm, end of the eighties, I was in Europe. I learned a little bit of German. So that's been, oh, please. How long? I mean, maybe almost 40 years. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I don't, couldn't imagine that I would remember anything. So my husband and I started watching, um, it's on Hulu, Deutschland 83. And I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm reading the subtitles and it's like, I'm understanding things and all, and I'll just be going through the day and, and words are just starting to pop into my head. I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember that. So it, it was, it's in there, you know, it just needs to be woken up. So I know you'll be able to do it and you have a place where you can go. I'll be right there if you want to try it out at violinlab.com. And yeah, we'll get you going.